us read together the prayer of confession from our bulletins, pausing to consider how the words affect us. Let us pray. O oh God, your word challenges our lives and makes us question those things we think are true. Listen to us as we consider those things we desire and those which we think will make us happy. And let us pause to answer that question individually in our hearts. And we continue. Your word calls fortunate those who trust in you, who delight in your ways, and who long for a solid relationship with you. Forgive us when our search for happiness has taken us in ways that are not your way. Help us by your spirit to turn again to you and to seek first and above all your sustaining presence. This we ask in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> words of assurance of God's forgiveness. Friends, you have been called and claimed by the God of all things and by the abundance of God's grace and by the power of God's love, your sins have been forgiven. And so go in peace. Amen. Jesus tells us to live according to the law of God with these words. You shall love God with all your heart, mind, spirit, and strength. This is the first and greatest commandment, and a second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. On these two laws depend all the law and the prophets. This is the good news of the gospel. Therefore, let us stand and join our voices together in singing to the glory of God. today is from the book of Matthew chapters 22 15 through 22 let us pray dear father thank you for all your blessings help us today as we consider your word help the reader and the listeners to understand your meanings in Jesus name amen the question about paying taxes then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what he said so they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth 
and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to Christ. Our worship continues with hymn number 377. Let us pray. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Today's reading from Matthew is the first in a series of three passages in that section um, that show Jesus being very pointedly and very maliciously tested by the Jewish religious leaders in order to trap him by his words. We are in Holy Week, just before we look forward to Advent and preparing for the baby Jesus. This particular account of the interchange between Jesus and the Pharisees about paying taxes is immediately followed by the Sadducees, another sort of ruling sect in the temple, questioning him about the resurrection and what that means. And then we have in next Sunday's reading for our scripture, the Pharisees are back with a question about what is the greatest commandment. So that will be next Sunday. Finally, Jesus responds with a question to the Pharisees about the Messiah. Those Four encounters follow Jesus' teaching in the Jerusalem temple. He was teaching to the masses and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the rulers were getting more and more tense and testy and worried. And Jesus declines to say by whose authority he's teaching. 
And then he tells that series of parables that we've heard over the past several weeks and ratchets up the temperature of the guards. And he is, as we heard today, boldly critical of the religious authorities. He called them to their faces hypocrites. So by calling attention directly to the various obligations that we have, Jesus is reminding us of the differences that exist for us as citizens of a state, citizens of a government, and uh, citizens of heaven. Jesus carefully suggests that we owe the state exactly what is demanded of us. In this case, the coin that has Caesar's head on it. And by contrasting that injunction to give unto Caesar what is Caesar's, he says, and give unto God what is God's. The Pharisees are more concerned about their own power than they are about honoring God. So the narrative today culminates in that warning Jesus gave to his followers. The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Therefore, do whatever they teach you and follow it, but do not do as they do, for they don't practice what they teach. This story today is often used for a basis as a reflection on the relationship between church and state. And there were huge debates during the Reformation in the early days. Is the church separate from the state? Is, should the state be completely ruled by and influenced by the church? How do we open, run, start, design a town or a community based on what we perceive as Christian values and still have laws that pertain to everybody? Uh, Martin Luther's reading of the passage helped him to develop his doctrine of the two kingdoms, which distinguished God's spiritual rule through the gospel or Bible and through the church with God's political or secular rule. He said it is all God's ultimately, but through laws and authorities of the state. Luther's reasoning was that the soul is not under the authority of Caesar. He cannot teach it or guide it, nor kill it or give it life, nor bind it nor loose it, neither judge it nor condemn it, neither hold it fast nor release it. But with respect to body, property, and honor, such matters are under Caesar's authority. So human bear beings, we bear God's image and wherever we live and operate, whether it's in social, economic, political, or the religious realm, we belong to God, ultimately. Our primary loyalties don't switch when we leave this building and go into our homes or into our places of business or, or even into the polling place, for example. Human beings created in the image of God are called always to recognize that we belong to God. And so in that there is a relationship to be established and upheld for each one of us between our faith and our actions, between praising God and doing justice. In a country, this country where we live, in which the gap between the very rich and the poor is ever growing, it seems. Social justice and Christian responsibility become a key topic for us as individuals and as a church. How are we expected to reflect God's image in our own lives and in our very selves? Well, I came across five really accessible ways for our actions to reflect our professed belief in the teachings of Jesus. And it's not about you and me being saved. It's not about me and my savior. It is about our living into the kingdom, the realm of God in our lives to do honor to Christ. It's our response to having been saved by Jesus already. So five ways. 
by proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, by sharing our faith whenever and wherever we can, uh, to teach, to baptize, and to nurture new believers, and that's becoming more and more challenging in our culture, to respond to human need by giving loving service. And I look around and see so many of us are already doing that in so many ways. Four, to transform unjust structures of society, transform them, to challenge violence of every kind and pursue peace and reconciliation. And today in our world at large, that is such a huge topic and concern. How do we transform unjust structures of society? And how do we effectively challenge violence and pursue peace and reconciliation. And the lastly, to strive to safeguard the integrity of creation and to sustain and to renew the life of the earth itself, the home we were given. Those five marks of mission encourage reflection on the way in which our faith is communicated as individuals and as a church through teaching, through worship and praise, through practically caring for one another, through attention to the questions of justice and through awareness of the impact of our own actions on the environment. All of those things are aspects of ways to share our faith. How do we keep them in balance? Does everybody have to do all of them all the time though? It becomes mind boggling. And then we get into what is your gift? Where are you placed? What are you talented and energized to do? And how can you tick those boxes in your own way? Sometimes it's just as simple as supporting someone else who is doing something that you are unable to do, but is the right thing. Well, my son is very fond of saying, follow the money to determine how we're doing. One of my credit card companies, and maybe some of you have the same experience, very kindly and helpfully provides me with a pie chart at the end of the year that graphically pictures how I've spent my money through the year, through their company, whether it's utilities or recreation, um, dining out, clothes, automobile expenses, you, you get the idea. And yes, it has absolutely changed the way I spend my money that pie chart, it means that I don't charge things on that credit card anymore. Um, seriously though, it's helpful in some way to know how you spend your money. And so I challenge you today to ask yourself what part of you, your gifts, your resources, your time, your energy, do you give over to whom? Um, individually, and, and that's a question for us as a church, as a congregation as well. This nonprofit religious organization, how do we spend our money? For instance, there are even little tiny ways in our daily lives in which we constantly make choices about how we spend our personal and our corporate resources. Do you pause to help an old person in the grocery store? Or do you just kind of move by because you really are in a hurry? Simple decision. Uh, do I serve on the consistory or yet another committee? Or do I put my energy more directly in other ways into the congregation that I serve? Again, how are you doing on that pie chart? Do I ignore the abuse another is undergoing at work? or outside in order to protect myself and my paycheck? And that's a huge question that we have seen challenged over and over again in the last decade in regard to minorities and women and business structure. Do I pocket the incorrect change given to me when I pick up my morning coffee or do I give it back? I think for most of us, I'm sure that's a Simple question, of course you give it back. Do I show up at the community meeting to speak out even though I may be laughed out of the room, and that includes church meetings, or do I just not go at all because I don't think that my voice makes a difference? 
do I recycle or do I throw my plastic and paper in with the rest of the trash because it just is a bother right now and I'm too busy and it seems like it's too much effort right now this week because then I have to take them out and how much difference is one bag of trash going to make in the world? It's not just one. Indeed, do I take the time to call my representatives to advocate for a just budget, measures addressing climate change, or reasonable gun control, whatever that means to you? Or do you make the excuse that I'm just too busy or somebody else is taking care of that stuff? And it goes on and on and on, a hundred little decisions made on a daily basis that bring up the question this morning of how are you made in God's image through it all? Are you living your life remembering that what you do reflects directly on how closely you recognize that you are, every one of us is, in fact, a child of God created in God's own image, male and female, God created, and God said they are very good. So apparently, this very dramatic moment in Matthew's gospel isn't just about paying taxes, thank God. The truth is all of life is a constant awareness of and negotiation for all that we have and all that we are. And I'm quite certain that by Jesus using the example of the emperor's face on a coin, he's actually pointing to all of us, to all of those things which compete for our obedience and our loyalty and our specific behaviors on a daily basis. And I think this is true as well, that you and I and those who gather around these words this morning Worldwide, this is the revised common lectionary. Every minister I've spoken to this week said, what are you saying about that Matthew passage? It is all of us. We belong to God. From the beginning, God's image has been imprinted on each of us. And that being the case, that it follows that we are and all we have and all we hope to be also belongs to God. So given that, I have some wondering questions. What would it look like if you took a personal inventory of your life today, starting maybe with your checkbook or your calendar? A dear old Reformed Church friend, uh, gosh, his first name just escaped me. His last name was Troost. He was the head of the Regional Synod of Albany for years, and he came around when I was a young Christian ed director in Clifton Park and gave a speech on stewardship. And he said, just look through your checkbook and see where your money goes. And that's always stuck with me. What would that reveal for you? What might you discover as you look over the past week or month and consider how many times your particular actions or lack of action was motivated by fear and not courage, by despair and not hope? And how does that reflect the truth that all of it and all of you belongs to God, that you bear the image of God? How are you showing and sharing God into the world, not only as individuals, but for all of us together as a congregation, as a church? That struggle, that sorting out, that constant <laughs> examining and re-examining and transforming and reforming is how we each together also answer those questions. It seems to me what it means to seek a life of faith is to strive always to give back to God what already belongs to God day by day and to work out what it means for each one of us. And that means all of who I am and all of who you are, all of us together, all of the time, there is strength and love and grace in that. Let us pray. 
to the God of our yesterdays, our todays, and our tomorrows unto eternity, be all honor and glory, now and forevermore. Amen. God, may our offerings given today demonstrate the truth of our love, love for you, for our fellow human beings, and for the world. Bless these tithes and offerings this day, that they may be multiplied and used to shine the gospel into the world, to benefit more souls, and to fill more needs in your realm. It is in the name of Jesus that we ask it. Amen. Let us with humble thanksgiving and praise make our requests known to God as we close our eyes and bow our heads, aware of being in God's presence at all times, and bring our prayers before God. Gracious God, we pray for peace, justice, and reconciliation throughout the world. We pray for the honoring of human rights, and for the relief of the oppressed. 
We give thanks for all that is good in the lives of men and women and children. And this day especially, we praise you for the gift of children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and for the opportunities to parent and mentor young lives in your grace and love. And we thank you for the blessings and possibilities for the future in the marriage of Kevin Casey and Melanie Luke, celebrated here yesterday. O oh God, in these times of diminishing congregations, we pray for the renewal of the church in faith, in love, and in service. We pray for the life of this congregation and the wider church. We give thanks for the gift of your word, the grace of the sacraments, and the fellowship of your people. God, fill the earth with your steadfast love, and may we be elements of that filling. We pray for our local communities, for our country, and for all people in their daily life and work. We pray for the young and the elderly, for families, for all who are alone. Especially this day, we bring before you Florence, Trevor, Florence, Naomi and Charles, Alicia, Jerry, Nancy and Norman, Chris, Claire, and we ask that you be with them in the ways that they need. We pray for those who are sick, for the sorrowful, for the bereaved. We pray for all who bring comfort, who bring care and healing. We give thanks for human love and friendship and for all that endures in our daily lives. O oh God, this day we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray to the mercy and protection of God in the name of Jesus as we pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us join our voices together in the closing hymn number 40, singing verses one, two, and four.
And so our service here is ended. Our service to the world and in the world continues. So go in peace. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God lift his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.